Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Sorry about that. I, I know I'm muted. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I do have a few announcements regarding our schedule as well as some special public comment period periods. Um, first, the board is currently accepting public comment on the Clover Health Partners LLC FY22 budget submission. We'd ask that all public comment sub should be submitted to us by close of business on Friday, March 11th, in order to be considered uh, before the staff analysis pre presentation, which will occur on March 16th. And more information on that submission can be found on our board's website. In addition, uh, last week, um, the board discussed the certificate of need dollar thresholds and the board's authority to adjust them and whether the board will need to adjust them for inflation. That presentation can be found also on our website and on our under our public comment um, submission page. And we are currently accepting public comments regarding that presentation. In addition, we are accepting public comment regarding a potential next model with our partners at CMMI, CMMI put an extra M in there, and um, we will be sharing any public comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on that model. And then in terms of a scheduling announcement, our press release has been updated and um, next Thursday, March 17th, we've added a board meeting. It will start at 8 a.m. And that is to discuss Rutland Regional Medical Center's mid-year budget adjustment. And um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me or to Kara for any of that scheduling. And that is all I have to announce today. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda is the minutes of Wednesday, March 2nd. Is there a motion? So moved. moved. Seconded. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 2nd without any um, additions, deletions, or corrections. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion passed unanimously. So that takes us right into the uh, uh, heart of today's meeting, and we're going to be taking a look at um, the fiscal year 21 actuals for our hospitals here in Vermont. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Rooney to lead that discussion. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Am I coming through loud and clear? You are. Excellent. All right. I'm going to get us squared away and let me know when you can see the presentation. <clears throat> we can. Super. All right. We will get started. So good afternoon, board members, uh, members of the public and stakeholders in this process. Uh, as uh, the chair alluded to, we are here to discuss the 2021 financial results of the Vermont hospital system and the individual hospitals therein. Uh, 2021 uh, was its own unique year. Again, another uh, fiscal year in uh, on a pandemic footing. Uh, so we're going to touch on uh, some of the uh, results of that as we go through this. Uh, but a brief overview here on slide two first, uh, touch on quickly on what the year end review is and its relationship to the board's uh, enforcement uh, regulation component. We'll navigate into a system wide analysis of the hospital system and then into each individual hospital's profiles in which we'll touch on uh, various components related to each hospital. Uh, and then we'll do a quick overview of some of the supporting materials that you can find in the appendix of this presentation. And we'll move it back to the board for discussion from there. 
So the fiscal year in review, uh, each hospital as part of their uh, 2021 budget order is required to submit their actual results for 2021, uh, including their audited financial statements. And those organizations where it's applicable who have uh, parent organizations are also required to uh, provide their uh, consolidated financial statements that provide a look over the uh, various uh, organizations that exist underneath that parent. And so for those following along at home, uh, we have a quick link here on the page highlighted in blue that will take you to those submissions <clears throat> on the Green Mountain Care Board website. Enforcement. The board uh, historically has used the results of this presentation to uh, discuss potential enforcement on hospitals who have exceeded or fallen short of their budgeted uh, net patient revenue levels. Uh, and so for the last couple of cycles, citing uh, the environment that exists within the pandemic and some of the struggles uh, to budget in that space and operate in that space, the board has waived that regulatory authority. And so we wanted to follow up on that and recap that really quickly. Again, we have a quick link to the minutes for those following at home uh, where you can see the board's action taken on enforcement. So there will be no enforcement based on the results presented today. Uh, and that did not preclude hospitals asking for uh, mid-year adjustments, um, despite that enforcement being waived. They would still have that capacity to do so. So just recapping on uh, some activity from a year ago that uh, potentially could have related to the results that we're providing today. So we're going to move into the system-wide analysis, and we're going to come right out and show uh, the Vermont hospital system from an actual to budget perspective, an actual to actual perspective. Uh, and also the margin activity on a five year look back. And it's very important that we provide a lot of context in this space uh, because 2021 is a difficult year to assess looking back from actual to budget. Uh, 2020 was a lot easier because the budgets that were created and approved were done so in a pre pandemic world, making the actual results of 2020 very stark compared to what these organizations had assumed was going to happen. And so a lot of those hospitals shared a lot of common uh, issues with the way the pandemic rolled out, which made the work from last year easier to look at because we could really broad stroke a lot of the financial results that happened. The difficulty with 21 began during the 2021 budget process, and we have to go back in time because context is important to remember that when these budgets were built, Hospitals built them without a significant component of their operational capacity in that during April, May and June of 2020, they were operating without uh, revenues derived from non-emergent elective procedures as those had been suspended. And that was about 25 percent of their fiscal year, which can cause issues with uh, the data aggregation that they're using to predict their budgets and also the assumptions that they're, they're deriving from that data. And that doesn't even factor in the overall onset of the pandemic and how that was going to play out throughout the rest of that year. So the way hospitals approached budgets was very disparate. And you can tell here in the upper left hand corner, we had a variance from budget where the system underperformed by forty four point two million dollars. UVM Medical Center alone, which carries the largest portion of revenues for the system, underperformed by one hundred and seven million dollars. So what that means is that we had several hospitals who, with their own reasons and their own logic, conservatively budgeted and then blew through those budgets. But no one's to say they were wrong either then and now as to their approach, because simply nobody knew what was going to happen and how 2021 was going to play out or how even their 2020 results were going to play out in which they were building those budgets. So it really makes it difficult uh, with the actual to budget look and even the actual actual look to uh, derive much from that other than the environment continues to move and it continues to be shaped on an annual basis, a fiscal year basis. <clears throat> so the situation on the ground in 20 was different from the situation on the ground in 21 and that continues to change going into 22. A year ago, many of us were looking forward to becoming vaccinated and thinking we'd put this pandemic behind us. Lo and behold, we have the rise and severity of the Delta variant. And then towards the end of the hospital's fiscal year in August and September, the Omicron variant begins to take hold. And that has really put a lot of stress on them coming into 2022. So each year is going to bring its own challenges. 
each year is going to bring its own unique uh, complex components that are going to make uh, look back analysis against budget very, very difficult. Uh, some of the constants that we can depend on are operating expenses. Uh, operating expenses due to a variety of factors uh, continue to outperform budget. Uh, and that was true in 2021. And looking over at operating expenses for uh, actual to actual in 2020, 2020's operating expenses came in almost on budget for the system as hospitals uh, uh, tried to secure as much uh, of the supply and safety uh, components that they needed to keep their workers and their patients safe from the original onset of the pandemic. And also uh, major outlays to physically reshape their facilities, including air handling systems uh, and safety protocols <clears throat> to keep both the public and their workers safe. So uh, the operating expenses, uh, the increase that we're seeing here, actual to actual and over budget, are very significant components uh, to the challenges that exist. And we've seen in 2021, those challenges and expense areas have continued to evolve in uh, inflation being a, a growing inflation being a factor. Workforce, of course, is a major component as salaries and benefits make up between 60 and 65 percent of total operating expenses for the organizations. The reliance on travelers and also to some extent rebound in volume. As volumes go up on a hospital by hospital basis, so does the need for those supporting uh, supplies and drugs to, that uh, help facilitate good patient care. Uh, so the net net result of all of this is a system that produced about an $88 million operating margin. And this really requires a lot of context. And I apologize if I sound ominous here, um, but uh, it's it needs to be made clear uh, for folks listening that these margins were not organically derived. And what I mean by that is uh, the core patient care uh, operations of the hospitals are not uh, responsible for the large majority of the margins that were produced in this year. And <clears throat> for those hospitals that produced a margin, uh, they largely cited um, federal and state relief playing a very significant role in this, if not a total role in this. Um, lab and testing and vaccine revenues playing a major role in this. And the point of me making those two connections is that those are not revenue sources that in the future are going to be there at the scale or at all moving into 2022 or 2023. So that's what I mean by non-organically derived uh, margins is that the operations of the hospitals largely are not responsible for the system-wide margin here. Additionally, several hospitals noted that they brought over into their income statements on 21 and officially recognized relief monies that they received in 2020. If you recall a year ago when we were having this conversation, several hospitals were hesitant to book some of those relief dollars for a couple of factors. One, they couldn't justify the use of those COVID relief funds in their operations. And two, federal guidance had continued to evolve. And so what may have been true uh, a few weeks prior may not have been true later on, and then that would change again. So to be safe, they kept those dollars on their balance sheets and in 2021 became more comfortable and more confident as the pandemic dragged on and guidance became clear to begin to actualize those on their income statements. So it's a very stark difference from 20 to 21 on margin. And as you can see, looking back, uh, one could walk away from this and assume that the system uh, has benefited from the pandemic. But I'm here to caution that that's not true. And because of those, uh, non-organically derived margins, uh, the system's capacity to, to duplicate a margin like that in 22 is unlikely. I hope I'm wrong about that, uh, but that's where things stand based on what we know today, <clears throat> looking back at 2021. To highlight some of those factors, and this is a, a, a perspective that we began to apply last year to try to illustrate for the board and folks at home, the ebb and flow of the severity of pandemic and the dollars being pushed into the system to keep it upright. Uh, we can see here that over the quarters, one, two, three, and four, uh, the other 13 hospitals that are not the UVM Medical Center continued to produce uh, 
uh, positive operating margins. And towards the end of the year, they begin to grow for those other 13 hospitals. And a lot of that has to do with the recognition of uh, some federal stimulus monies coming through and uh, some of the vaccine clinics that were taking that these hospitals were standing up and lab testing was a major component of driving NPR at some hospitals as well. We can see that the University of Vermont Medical Center's uh, track record over this uh, really uh, slingshots uh, in the first two quarters. And of course, in Q1, ongoing effects from the pandemic at the hospital, the closure, continued closure of Fannie Allen, which was suppressing volumes and revenues and patient care. Uh, and then the most significant of all, the cyber incident that occurred there in the fall of 2020. And that really set the hospital back, uh, not just that quarter, but operationally for the year. And then in quarter two, the hospital, uh, UVM Medical Center, was able to attain significant uh, dollars in, st in relief uh, to assist with its uh, pandemic response. And some of that money they were overlooked uh, in 2024, which came in close to $40 million of it. So that really turned uh, the financial results of the hospital around. Uh, and then from then on out, <clears throat> they had a smaller margin in Q3 and they fell back into the red uh, for Q4. And ultimately their contribution to the overall system was about $36.5 million. So we've also highlighted here where the system would be uh, without that stimulus money. And it's it's a pretty concerning look that the potential uh, out there would be that the system could produce in excess of a $40 million loss um, should that uh, stimulus money not have come through predominantly at the University of Vermont Medical Center. So I say all of that uh, because all of this, of course, is going to play a factor in our 2023 guidance as we move forward. <clears throat> and uh, even though we create these artificial fiscal years, um, the longer the pandemic plays out, the more these factors are going to roll into uh, the future impact that the system has to absorb. And so uh, really keeping the context around the fact that um, society to some extent feels like it wants to move on from the pandemic. Uh, however, the pandemic is not over and the components of the pandemic that have uh, allowed the system to operate at the capacity it has, i.e. relief funding, uh, does not seem to be in sight moving forward. And so that's going to play a significant part in the discussions we'll have in budgets going into the 2023 process. And at the bottom of uh, slide seven here, a recap, uh, just different context with and without UVMC and all hospitals, and you can see the contribution from UVM versus the other 13 hospitals over the last several years. 2021 certainly stands out with uh, those other 13 hospitals, as I stated, outperforming uh, uh, collectively the margin of the University of Medical Center, which has not been true looking back over the several fiscal cycles. <clears throat> Payer mix is something that we always uh, pay attention to here in what is predominantly still a fee-for-service environment. Uh, and what's important, as we stated last year, is that from the 10,000-foot uh, perspective, the system level, we don't notice a whole lot of shift in payer mix. Uh, that shift begins to occur more notably on a hospital-by-hospital -hospital basis, um, as reported to us by uh, the 14 organizations in the state. So providing uh, some pure numbers here, uh, you can see what I was talking about uh, as it relates to budget to actual performance on a hospital by hospital basis, uh, <coughs> quite a range going on there, uh, which ultimately uh, creates a negative 1.6% variance for the system, uh, but we go as high as uh, uh, outproducing budgets at 13% to underperforming budgets at 7.6%, uh, and the actual to actual variances become even larger uh, on the whole. Uh, and again, that has to do largely with that suppression of revenues as a result of the suspension of certain procedures uh, for nearly 25% of the fiscal year in 2020. Uh, but certainly an illuminating uh, perspective of our pandemic uh, existence from a financial perspective uh, and one that will um, likely continue as hospitals struggle to uh, create accurate budgets and then deal with the operational um, challenges that seem to arrive on a regular <coughs> basis on a year-to-year -year, uh, basis as well. 
This is just another perspective that we wanted to provide the board and for those who are on the board at that time, uh, we use this as a way to uh, approach an illustrative component to reasonability at budget time. And so the one change that we have here is that that green line, uh, which we've labeled system actual at budget time was a, an individual hospital's projection. And what we were trying to do was coming off of 19, the last quote unquote normal year, of operations for the hospitals pre-pandemic was trend forward a 3.5% MBR FPP growth rate. And we did that because the board has approved a 3.5% growth rate in each one of those years, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So hypothetically speaking, where would everything end up if it had been somewhat normal? Uh, and then the I bars represent a plus one or minus one variance from that 3.5%. And so we can see that the hospital system in 2020, 2021, excuse me, uh, budgeted just over 3.5% uh, growth on the whole, uh, a little probably around four or so percent, uh, and underperformed that by almost 1.6%. Uh, so they actually did not meet that 3.5% trend. Uh, and then again, hospital budgets for 2022 are looking to take uh, the system about $100 million over where that trend would be, and we will see what the results of that are going to be in about a year's time. Uh, so the situation continues to change. Uh, we, we do not know yet what how the hospitals will come out of the uh, first, fiscal, first and second fiscal quarters and what it may mean as uh, Omicron subsides uh, and the hospitals begin to uh, drive through more volume throughout the summer months when folks begin to have a little more confidence about getting back into that healthcare space. So an another perspective, I believe it's slide 67. We've done these for each and every hospital in the system, and you can really see how uh, disparate the uh, budgets and results are uh, from an illustrative perspective as it relates to hospital performance, uh, just like the system-wide perspective we have on the screen here. <clears throat> Another perspective about how the system has fared against what the board has approved for NPR growth, and we can see that overall uh, the system was unperform uh, underperforming the board's approved growth ceiling in 17, 18, and 19. And then we have uh, FY20 in which the system uh, did not grow. In fact, it stepped back 6.3% uh, from 2019. And then again, we have that slingshot effect in 2021, uh, where the system grew 13.1% over its 2020 comparable. So <clears throat> uh, you can see how quote unquote normal uh, and stable uh, that uh, that NPR growth was from the years 17 and 19, and then where the pandemic has left uh, the system. Again, just to highlight uh, how difficult it is to uh, to budget, to operate, and to regulate in this space. <clears throat> uh, just this is kind of a boilerplate that we had to put in here. Um, it's not just CARES Act funding anymore. It's uh, any relief funding or ARPA funding, what have you, that has been approved and distributed by state and federal authorities. Uh, the guidance uh, continues to be in question. I don't think it is as uh, uh, and stable as it was a year ago. I think things have probably uh, become a little more formative by now, uh, but still the result of that is um, that there's still some uncertainties and uh, things could change, uh, technically speaking, uh, but most hospitals and their auditors uh, within their narratives for 2021 felt very comfortable in booking those revenues. I think we only had one hospital who continues to experience some concerns in that space overall. Uh, but we do need to point this out as it could have an impact on uh, some future numbers. So uh, we'll take our numbers today and consider them good for now. Uh, and if they change, uh, then we'll, we, we will update those changes in future iterations uh, of this presentation. <clears throat> an important component in this uh, uh, pandemic space is uh, reliance on other operating revenue. And it, it is important for folks at home to understand that uh, this is where hospitals are booking relief funding. Uh, and so there is a significant growth in that space. As you can see, 15.8% uh, 
2020 and 13.8% in 2021. And that is uh, other operating revenue as a percentage of total revenue. So it is a much larger part in the last two years than it was leading up to that. Um, moving to slide 14, we've broken it out uh, for the folks looking at the presentation. And you can see on the left hand side in, in the teal bars uh, that there was some natural growth uh, that was driving those other operating revenues. A lot of it had to do with uh, hospitals increasing their contracting on 340B to provide low cost drugs uh, and also uh, specialty pharmacy growth, which is almost entirely contributed to University of Vermont Medical Center, was driving those. And so you can see there's still some continued growth in that space on a year to year basis that is significant uh, as, as hospitals use those revenue streams to meet the operational expense demands of their day to day existence. Uh, on top of that, we've bifurcated and broken out the uh, reported um, COVID-19 stimulus dollars that have been recognized on income statements. There is a difference between uh, recognition on income statements and what they've received. So this is what they have recognized for 2020 and 2021. And we're looking about $330 uh, million of uh, stimulus and other relief funding that has come in and been recognized by the system to help offset some of those pandemic challenges that have existed. And so uh, these other operating revenues have become an important part to keeping uh, some of those margins uh, on the positive side, uh, operationally speaking. <clears throat> Looking at operating expenses, uh, again, uh, the budget equation component of this certainly plays a part, uh, but more so is uh, the circumstances of each individual hospital. And, uh, you know, we'll, I'll highlight uh, Rutland Regional here. Rutland came in in 2021 with a pretty conservative budget, both on revenues and, of course, expense side, uh, and then it far exceeded their expectations for that year uh, with volume rebound, uh, et cetera. So <clears throat> um, their variance is going to be significantly higher. And, of course, that all has to do with the budgeting approach taken by the hospital. And so the variance is there again. Uh, shift wildly, uh, but you can tell that the majority of those uh, exceeded their uh, budget expectations. And some of that does have to do with, like I said, a rebound in volume, inflationary and workforce pressures uh, that are certainly playing a part in the system today. And the actual experience, that's more telling uh, than anything, because as I said, uh, the actual experience of hospitals uh, operating expenses were uh, as a system uh, almost on budget. Uh, and so the system itself growing at 7.5% is, is an indicator that uh, hospitals are incurring some pretty high uh, operating expenses. And were it not for that federal relief money, we'd probably be looking at uh, some significant uh, margin deficits in that space. <clears throat> looking at margin just over the last couple of cycles and versus budget, uh, you can see that um, 2020 and 2021, uh, there is significant large uh, margins being produced by these hospitals. And again, some of that does have to do with hospitals who were hesitant to recognize some of those relief funds, which may have uh, put them into a profitable space in the prior year. Uh, but this time around, they decided to recognize those. And you can tell that as hospitals budgeted uh, their margin, the system was about $52 million and they far exceeded uh, the expectations of uh, their budgeted uh, margins on the whole. Uh, and so <clears throat> we only had two organizations uh, operating at a margin deficit for the year 2021. And the next slide, providing a five-year look back, uh, we can watch uh, margins enter uh, positive territory over the last couple of fiscal cycles. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the activity that's being experienced on uh, with federal and state relief funding and the recognition therein. Again, uh, not uh, organically derived in 2021. Uh, and so with no additional federal relief on the horizon and the pandemic uh, potentially setting hospitals back, rising costs, et cetera, and the ripple effects therein, um, it's going to be very difficult for the system to reproduce these type of margins uh in 2022 
And again, I hope I'm wrong about that, uh, but with everything that's uh, swirling in the environment right now, that appears unlikely uh, to be a reproduction of 2021's operating margin results. Operating margin percentage, this is another perspective that we supply to put it in the context of the individual hospital. Uh, sometimes the dollar perspective doesn't mean much to folks. So, uh, for example, uh, Mount Scotney produced a $6 million margin, but that is a excess of 9% uh, surplus on margin here for them. And you can see where Central Vermont and Brattleboro came in in negative territory. Uh, but for the most part, uh, pretty healthy margins, the median of 4.5% at the bottom there compared to prior year medians, uh, some of which were in negative territory, is certainly uh, a telling context to provide here. And then uh, the total for the system being about 2.8%. Um, and you can see that those positive margins uh, had a pretty good impact on their five-year average in turning some of the uh, look back around here at several of these organizations. So. Um, <clears throat> the pandemic is doing some strange things in the space of margins for these hospitals. But again, the context around how those margins came to be is the most important story to be told here. Moving into total margin space, um, as you can see, uh, all hospitals produce positive margins. Um, almost universally, hospitals cited return from investment portfolios as the reason for this type of activity, excuse me, the stock market in the past year uh, did very, very well. Um, <clears throat> Springfield uh, is the result of uh, some reconciliation due to the emergence from bankruptcy. Springfield does not have uh, much of an investment portfolio. And so that activity that you see there is accounting related as they came out of uh, their bankruptcy situation in the early part of calendar year 21. Um, and UVM is both investments and termination of pension obligation, uh, which has benefited them in that total margin space. So uh, it's quite uh, astounding that the system uh, has a total margin of nearly $300 million for fiscal year 21, much of which has to do with the performance of the stock market. Now, we don't pay too much attention here on staff to total margin because as the market goes, uh, so go these results. And as we know, in the last uh, couple of months here, uh, the market's performance has been sporadic at best. So uh, there's a potential that when we get to this space next year, the picture looks very, very different uh, from a total margin perspective at some of these hospitals. Uh, again, providing a similar look to the operating margin look back on five years again, uh, 2021, the only year with no negative uh, total margin activity, uh, the best performance year uh, and a dollar's basis of anything here. But as far as positive total margins, uh, the best year since 2017. Uh, and so, again, uh, just highlighting uh, the market's performance and contribution to these total margins of hospitals and both realized and unrealized gains uh, for the five year look back that we've provided here. Total margin percentage, again, providing some context uh, on a hospital by hospital basis as it relates to their uh, operations. Uh, so we can see here that uh, Springfield may have produced an $18 million total margin, but that's a 25% uh, total margin for them. Uh, UVM was $119 million, and that's a 7.1%. So it all has to do with the scale of operations at each one of these hospitals, but you can see um, the median of 10.3 percent throwing out Springfield and throwing out uh, 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 Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, the highest and the lowest. The median for the system was 10.3 percent, which far outstrips its prior year comparables, um, is a significant uh, show of uh, total margin activity at the uh, 14 organizations here in the state of Vermont. So again, providing uh, a little more context, illustrative context, if we can, uh, to the uh, very drastically different situation that was experienced in 2021 over a prior year comparable. So again, looking at 2020 actual to actual over its 2020 counterpart, and you can see the significant uh, NPR growth over uh, its prior year comparable. And then we wanted to put 2020 in here over 2019 to show you almost a mirror image of the opposite circumstances that we were looking at at this time last year. 
uh, even though the board has set a 3.5% growth rate, uh, it's very obvious how the system has reacted depending on uh, the situation that has evolved in the pandemic space. And so uh, even the system collectively there on the far right in green is almost a mirror image of uh, the opposite of what was occurring in the prior year space. Uh, and so <clears throat> it's a very difficult environment to for these hospitals to be operating in and for uh, this board to be regulating in when that is the uh, actual to actual experience that's being realized by each one of these organizations. Last year, we began to look high level at some balance sheet numbers, and that was important because of the infusion of relief money that was coming into the system. It came in in substantial amounts. It came in very quickly, and we wanted to make sure that when we were looking at these balance sheets, we understood what that meant for these organizations. And so when you look at 2020 over 2019, there's about a $400 million growth in current assets, uh, which are uh, assets that you own or are owed to you within a year. Uh, and the majority of that in that current space had to do with the infusion of cash. Uh, cash balances to the hospitals moved from about 200 or so million up to 560, which was what drove that uh, significant increase there at the same time accounts receivable were a little suppressed because of the cessation of those procedures and the loss of revenue and therefore loss of collection activity that hospitals would normally experience. So those cash balances are what drove current assets up. To be perfectly candid, I was expecting somewhat of a halfway uh, clawback uh, on these balances this year. But as you can see, that didn't happen. Current assets are still over $1 billion. And we'll talk a little bit more about common themes uh, as we migrate into the individual hospital space. But cash balances remain over $500 million. And they have come down about 50 or $60 million from their prior year counterpart, but they still remain elevated. Uh, more business activity in the form of uh, patient volume and revenues generated in that space have driven up net accounts receivable. There's also been a reduction on several hospitals and uncollectible accounts, which increases that uh, net component of accounts receivable. So uh, current assets are still hanging out over the $1 billion mark, uh, which <clears throat> as we migrate to the next tab for total assets is still what's keeping um, total asset values elevated at about $3.5 billion, uh, in addition to uh, some activity uh, on long-term assets as well, but predominantly it's being driven by that current asset space. So um, balance sheets are still very flush with cash as things stood as of uh, 9-30, 2021. Liabilities, uh, as everybody knows, uh, on those balance sheets and as part of that cash influx, there were advances from various payers, uh, public and private and uh, hospitals had begun the reclamation process for those uh, during their 2021 fiscal year. So those offsetting liabilities are beginning to be paid back or reclaimed uh, through the revenue cycle. Uh, and so um, liabilities are slowly coming down. Uh, a big change here uh, that was experienced that's uh, producing a good portion of this is um, Springfield's uh, activity there. You can see their uh, current liabilities came down from about 35 million to 12, and that is bankruptcy related adjustments that occurred on their balance sheet. Uh, and then uh, there's a series of activity in there, and some of this can be timing, uh, but some of it, most of it too, is, uh, is the uh, lowering of those liabilities that are related to uh, uh, COVID advances that were provided to the hospitals. Total liabilities are coming down as well. Um, major factor in this is that uh, capital projects uh, were largely uh, still frozen for the most part. There were some that were put back on. Uh, and so hospitals have not been incurring further debt, uh, which would drive up long-term liabilities in the form of long-term debt. So they're uh, paying those down. That is helping drive down uh, the total balances of liabilities here. Uh, and you can see that's come down uh, significantly from prior year, but it's still elevated over its 2019 uh, comparable, uh, but they are beginning to tick down. Uh, and only the uh, environment and how that changes will determine whether or not hospitals proceed with capital projects 
uh, moving forward and also the uh, kind of runaway costs that are being experienced in that space will also determine uh, their appetite for moving forward with some of those projects. So now we're going to begin to move into hospital profiles uh, and <clears throat> we provided this perspective here uh, because these are some touch points that folks at home want to see and board members want to see as well. So we provided each designation uh, for each hospital and we provided their 2021 actual results and the portion that they contribute to the entire system. And so, of course, you can see here that the University of Vermont Medical Center uh, carries the predominance of revenue uh, for the 14 organizations, followed by Rutland uh, and then <clears throat> uh, Grace Cottage being uh, contributing the least at 0.8%. And also um, continue to highlight how fixed perspective payment as it relates to healthcare reform fits in and how each individual how it relates to each individual hospital and the system as a whole. So it's roughly 14% for the system and then very, very different uh, based on hospital experience uh, and participation. Uh, and with Grace Cottage not participating, of course, that is going to be 0% and $0. Uh, and then we've provided their individual uh, budget to actual variance based on those actual numbers. So uh, kind of a, a blast of information there, um, but all important points to consider as we move through each one of these uh, organizations here. So common financial highlights, this is going to carry through to most of these hospitals. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about each hospital uh, because we tried to extract some of the com common components that uh, these hospitals experienced. Um, days cash on hand uh, is still uh, has excess cash in the system as a result of these 2019s and hospitals are being good stewards of, of those cash dollars, which is keeping them elevated um, net accounts receivable uh, after uncollectible accounts is factored in from gross are about $57 million higher. And a lot of that has to do uh, with the change in that uncollectible accounts balance, but also return of volumes on a hospital by hospital basis. And as you heard me discuss, capital projects have been selective. Um, some were restarted after being frozen in 2020. Some still remain on hold or delayed. Uh, due to the uh, continuing shift in the pandemic landscape as it relates to uh, each individual hospital. NPR, FPP, uh, there was some uh, utilization and volume rebound. Many hospitals cited outpatient services over 2020 as the reason for uh, net patient volume, or sorry, volume uh, rebound uh, and the, the uh, onset of mass vaccinations and a society more comfortable uh, moving about in the healthcare space has also contributed to a rebound of those volumes. Bad debt experience was mixed on an uh, individual hospital basis. Um, hospitals where maybe volumes weren't the reason uh, for NPR rebound uh, had a positive bad debt experience because uh, they did not incur bad debts at the level that they had originally budgeted uh, due to lower than anticipated volumes. Uh, and those hospitals who had Higher volumes had a negative uh, variance because they out they outstripped their uh, bad debt budget and free care budget. Um, there was also a FASB revenue recognition adoption by several hospitals, uh, and those changes uh, had an impact on the way hospitals account for that. So um, there could have been a positive or negative variance based on there. Uh, but if I recall correctly, the hospitals that recognized that. Uh, bad debt experience and revenue recognition had a positive adjustment to bad debt, meaning they had over budgeted based on their prior uh, <clears throat> prior assessment of their bad debt and free care. Payer revenue was also dependent on the hospital's experience, as we discussed at the outset. Uh, really depends on the organization and uh, how things played out for that hospital uh, over the last year. And then, as we talked about too, COVID nineteen testing and lab revenues. Uh, really help bolster some of these uh, NPR FPP figures. Another thing I might note in here too that several hospitals pointed out around uh, this space is that um, the relaxation of corridors related to ACO and um, uh, savings that resulted from ACO activity are also a driver of some of these um, NPR and FPP figures. Uh, so apologies for leaving that off. Um, other operating revenues, as we discussed, additional rounds of federal and state funding and the recognition of 2020 funds therein into 2021 and expansion of 340B retail pharmacy programs at several hospitals. Uh, we did have a hospital uh, continue to stress 
in their uh, narrative to us that um, they have significant concerns about how uh, big pharmaceutical companies pressure being applied to these 340B contracts uh, could shape the future of their 340B retail pharmacy programs and the revenues they derive from that. So uh, being transparent with uh, uh, respect to that individual hospital, that's a narrative that uh, they've been expressing for a couple of years now in that space. Operating expenses, salaries and expense uh, actually varied due to each hospital's experience. Uh, some hospitals uh, had salaries and expenses that surpassed their budget for uh, reasons cited, and we'll go into this further. Um, <clears throat> recognition uh, salary increases, retention salary increases, shift differential increases, et cetera. Um, but also some hospitals underperformed their salary expectations because they didn't have volume or they had staffing shortages uh, as it relates to the overall workforce challenges. Uh, and so that also trickles into fringe benefits too. That also varied. Um, some hospitals too had higher health claims, some citing uh, 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 families on staff who may have uh, delayed health care and were coming in and and filing those claims uh, or, or other uh, significant illnesses that occurred uh, during that space. But the salary fluctuations also uh, played a part in pension obligations and whatnot uh, based on the hospital's experience. Uh, traveler usage was a major component um, and workforce, workforce, workforce uh, should be a major consideration as we discuss each hospital's experience. There wasn't a single hospital uh, who was able to escape um, high traveler cost. I think Mount of Scutney was probably the most stable um, uh, staffing situation that I read uh, through in these narratives that were provided, uh, but an increased reliance in number of travelers required to continue to provide a safe level of care and meet the demands, uh, the resurgence in demand at some of these hospitals and also higher cost on that increased number. So really a double blast there of uh, cost growth uh, related to workforce challenges. Uh, inflationary and supply chain pressures continue to move costs higher. Uh, that was those were pressures that began to be felt in 2021 and have significantly carried through and been exacerbated moving into 2022. One thing I noted in several of the narratives was a connection to uh, first quarter experience, tying it back to 2021 and uh, really prepping the space for uh, costs potentially moving even higher as 2021 carries on based on that first quarter experience. Uh, de depreciation overall, uh, much lower as, as uh, capital projects were uh, continued for the most part to be on hold, which means that organizations did not take on um, <clears throat> uh, the expense related to those projects as they depreciate the cost over time. Uh, and then medical and pharmaceutical supply cost uh, mostly increased due to need, increased volume, as we discussed, uh, leads to increased uh, dependence on those supplies, uh, and also the price of those supplies continues to go up. And again, uh, that can be tied back too to the inflationary supply chain issues uh, that were being experienced uh, as the fiscal year closed and have been exacerbated uh, in 2022 as the experience has been thus far. Uh, again, common financial highlights, as we discussed with the system, investment returns were higher due to market value returns, Operating margins were mostly positive in large part due to federal and state relief. Total margins, again, tying it back to the investment returns, um, significant in many uh, experiences, uh, helped keep the system very well positioned in that total operating margin space. But again, uh, they are susceptible to market forces, as we all are. And uh, that can ebb and flow depending on what is occurring. So uh, for folks at home, as I stated, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on each individual hospital because I want to keep your attention. But if you're interested in reading about uh, either your area hospital or reading about each hospital throughout the system, we've provided an ease of use link there at the bottom of slide 30 for you to do so. Moving into individual profiles, this is a look that should be familiar. This is the exact same look we provided when we kicked this discussion off around the system. And again, uh, the budgeting activity in 2021 plays a significant part in some of these variances, as does 
uh, the activity that was uh, experienced in 2020. So you'll see the variance discussion here. Uh, uh, Brattleboro Memorial underperformed their budget by about four and a half uh, percent, um, and and operating expenses actually came in almost a percent under budget. But a lot of that had to do with uh, lagging volume. Uh, and then, of course, they outproduced their uh, 2020 comparable in a significant manner uh, as as uh, operations were more regular uh, than they were uh, through 2020. And for folks who who were paying attention at uh, the budget hearing, uh, when Brattleboro came in, they very candidly acknowledged that uh, the start of 2021 was very rough for them. And it wasn't until about March when things began to turn around from a volume perspective. And so uh, they they were in a significant uh, operating margin deficit leading up to about March of uh, 2021. Uh, and then over the course of the warmer months, uh, spring and summer, by the time they came in to uh, provide the Remount Care Board with their budget presentation, uh, were much more optimistic about how the year had unfolded since about March and April and, and leading up to that presentation. So um, they were optimistic that they would be able to claw back a lot of that loss on margin, and it appears that they did do that, although they weren't able to uh, bring the hospital into profitability, uh, but they did give it a pretty solid run to pull back from uh, what was looking like a significant operating loss in uh, at the start of that fiscal year. <clears throat> So Brattleboro here is exhibiting some uh, fluctuations in the uh, commercial payer mix space, um, a dip in 2020, no surprise given the uh, the issues around revenues as it related to cessation of those non-emergent elective procedures. Uh, and really on utilization, <clears throat> not a big rebound for the hospital here uh, overall, uh, when we look back at the total year, um, However, the physician office visit return is uh, is a positive here, given the activity that was exhibited in 2020. And we provided a two-year compound annual growth to try to capture uh, an illustration of how impactful rebounds in this space were. And so you can see that OR procedures uh, had a significant uh, rebound, which brought things a little bit back closer to level. Uh, for those couple of years. Uh, but when we look at physician office visits, yes, they were back, but the loss in that space um, for visits in 2020 was very significant, as uh, Brattleboro did outline to the board. Uh, the good news to take away from this is that days cash on hand remain respectable, as does the age of their physical plant. And so uh, even though they suffered a loss and some of those volumes hadn't returned, uh, there's still hope that uh, moving into uh, the better part of this year and beyond that Brattleboro can make, begin to recapture some of that uh, backlog of demand that likely exists in their community. <clears throat> uh, Central Vermont Medical Center, again, another hospital that uh, missed its NPR uh, budget by about three and a half percent. Operating expenses essentially came in on point. Uh, the, the largest component to uh, Central Vermont um, was COVID impact <clears throat> uh, that led to those suppressed uh, revenues uh, and also those uh, expenses coming in at budget. Um, where Central Vermont saved some money was in some of the uh, delays to capital projects such as the EPIC uh, phase two rollout. Um, <clears throat> but this hospital did have significant uh, contract labor um, pressures that uh, helped drive that margin into negative territory. Uh, much of the demand for that contract labor was at the Woodridge facility that's built into the Central Vermont budget. And so uh, the hospital continues to underperform. They did have a, uh, a positive trajectory coming out of 2018 in which the hospital was moving towards uh, a positive outcome, uh, but ultimately 2021 proved to be a bit of a setback uh, in that space. But um, it's not as significant of an operating loss as has been experienced in 19 and 20. And so there is that space with a hospital within the health network to try to recapture some of that momentum that they had uh, coming out of 2018. And again, uh, again, another hospital here that 
um, outstripped their NPR performance over 2020. No surprise there. Major variance, 17 percent, uh, but also operating expenses continue to rise at a clip of 6.8 uh, percent year over year. Uh, payer mix here uh, for this particular hospital, um, Medicare did, uh, as reported, did show an increase. Uh, commercial remained relatively stable with some erosion, uh, and Medicaid fell back uh, slightly in 2021 over 2020. Uh, OR procedures, uh, significant rebound there um, over their 2020 counterpart. Um, ER visits still uh still coming in and lagging behind and that that's a theme that several hospitals have experienced that er visits have not come back to pre-pandemic levels um, but the physician's office visits to a slight rebound there in uh, 2021 over 2020 so some positive that uh, the, the community is getting out and getting uh, in front of their physicians for uh, important healthcare discussions that need to occur for all of us um, a day's cash on hand is not quite as high as we would like to see for this hospital. Age of plant is still respectable, um, but the Central Vermont does have the wind at its back in that uh, phase two of Epic has now been launched and there should be some efficiencies uh, gained from that. So hopefully that improves the financial position of the hospital and they have the support of the network as a whole uh, to get the hospital back on track. So hoping that the organization can take advantage of some of those changes going into 2022 and beyond. <clears throat> uh, Copley Hospital. Copley uh, was an organization that uh, exceeded its budget uh, from 2021, 11.3%. Operating expenses, however, really uh, exceeded budget uh, at a clip of 15.2%. And again, no surprise, surprise. how preferring <laughs> its actual 2020 comparable. Uh, Copley really cited um, uh, reimbursement and contractual allowances being favorability to them. They did not experience much of a volume rebound. It was mainly in that reimbursement space um, <clears throat> uh, and largely a shift from inpatient to outpatient uh, as it relates to uh, some of the volumes that they had. So uh, Copley did have quite a rebound, as you can see, in NPR performance uh, and also uh, with margin as well. This organization, as you can see, has a history of operating losses and they did cite uh, that uh, federal and state relief was predominantly the reason that they have the $4.7 million margin that they experienced in 2021. Uh, and they were com more comfortable this year in uh, booking some of those revenues than they were at the same time in 2020. Uh, this is an organization that continues to have a very strong commercial payer mix. Uh, so that combined with some of the uh, positive nature of those uh, contractual allowances around reimbursement are what drove those revenues. Um, you can see here that they did have some rebound in utilization, uh, but overall they noted that their volume had not quite come back. Uh, physician office visits, OR procedures uh, is not a surprise for Copley, who uh, has an excellent orthopedics program. Um, ER visits again, another hospital. They have just not come back uh, to pre pandemic levels, and so they continue to lag uh, significantly. Uh, this is a hospital that, as you can tell at the bottom of slide 36, uh, the day's cash on hand has been significantly cushioned by relief dollars, um, and that the hospital was operating at a very low day's cash on hand until those relief dollars began to come in. So although those uh, days cash have been reduced from 2020, it is still about double what it was pre pandemic and apologies for the oversight here, but I think we do need to look into uh, the age of plant dropping uh, so significantly from 20 to 21. Uh, Copley has expressed on multiple uh, occasions that the physical plan of the hospital is aging and they haven't had the operating margins to uh, make necessary improvements in that space. And so I, I'm doubtful that uh, the data there is accurate. So we're going to have to look into uh, that and, and maybe have a conversation uh, with Copley, but we'll check our we'll check our own numbers first before we go um, having any conversations. Gifford Medical Center. <clears throat> uh, Gifford, again, uh, as is mostly the case throughout the system, outperforming their budget on both NPR and operating expenses in a significant way and their actual to actual comparable with 2020. 
uh, the story here continues to be a hospital that has recovered uh, from a low ebb in 2018. Um, they had a lot of positive activity year to year, 18 to 19, in improving that uh, loss on margin and then producing uh, a positive margin in 2020 and then uh, really ramping up uh, that margin activity in 2021. They again cite uh, federal and state relief being a major contributor to that margin, uh, but this is a hospital that uh, has a, a very different uh, financial situation today uh, than they did in 2018. Uh, so there are some positives coming out of that line. Uh, we know that uh, heading into 2020, uh, that organization had worked very hard to cut costs, maximize efficiencies, and really right size um, the organization's approach to healthcare. So um, we have no doubt that that is continuing and is uh, some in, in some way playing a part and the rebound of the financial situation there at the hospital, despite all the complications uh, that the pandemic has created for organizations such as that. Uh, Gifford did cite, however, that uh, there has been an erosion in their payer mix, and we can see that here. Um, it's probably the most stark example of payer mix erosion uh, with a significant uh, and rapid shift uh, year to year uh, from uh, commercial uh, coming down and and Medicare uh, payer mix rising. Um, there's really been an offset there between those two payers. Uh, they did experience some significant rebound in operating room procedures, as we can see. Uh, however, uh, physicians' office visits, uh, interestingly enough, uh, took a turn downward in 21 as opposed to uh, its prior uh, pandemic year counterpart. Uh, so overall, um, physician office visits over the last couple of years are off uh, from their pre-pandemic comparable. And this is a hospital that, uh, from a physical plant perspective, is one of the oldest in the state. Uh, yet this hospital has maintained some significant cash balances leading up to the pandemic. And of course, that has been cushioned by the relief dollars and the profitability that the, uh, the organization has experienced over the last couple of years. Um, so I would anticipate that some point in the near future, um, Gifford is going to use some of those dollars uh, once they uh, have a better understanding of the environment uh, in the pandemic or hopefully uh, coming out of it, um, where they're going to look to make some investments in that organization, which will deplete cash and also the age of their plant as well. Uh, but we've had no conversations with them on that, Mark, but that is generally what happens with organizations that have stockpiled uh, large amounts of cash is that eventually they're going to make an investment. I apologize for the dog barking if you can hear that. We must have a delivery. Uh, Grace Cottage, um, another hospital outperforming their budget, uh, but operating expenses uh, really outstripping budget at 7%, and of course, uh, outperforming their 2020 comparable. Um, <clears throat> the operating margin here uh, tells quite a story. This is an organization. Uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Uh, cannot hear you now, though. I think we've temporarily lost Patrick. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I'll text okay. Patrick, Kevin, and um, I think he needs to to go off and come back on. OK. And I I believe the team is here, too. Um, Lori is here, so let me. Get on the phone and get back up. Perfect. So while we're waiting, um, We'll ask the newest board member if he has any entertainment uh, for everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the hazing part, Tom, where they make you do karaoke for everybody. <laughs> that would um, be a rough day for you all. <laughs> um, 
I think we have Patrick coming back. No, nope, he's goodness. leaving. <laughs> Lori, did you have anything to uh, uh keep us going while we're waiting for Patrick. He said he lost power for 30 seconds and he's coming back on. Sorry, go ahead, Lori. I have no entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to hear my dog barking, but I don't think so. And my dog is at the groomers today. <laughs> Yeah, he should be shortly back on. He said he's coming back on, and Lori will will have you as backup for sure. Yeah, I asked him if he wanted me to present. He said not unless I lose um, internet. It looks like he did. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I'll tell you what, why don't we take a five minute bio break and we'll come back. Um, Kara, if you could put a sign up that we'll be coming back at um, 211. Thank you. Well, hallelujah. It looks like we have Patrick back. <laughs> I'm back. I don't know for how long, but I'm back. Um, I'll call the I... meeting back to order and proceed, Patrick. Thank you. I hope that omnibus bill that they passed today has dollars allocated for rural internet. Uh, that's the last I'll say. Um, <clears throat> so Grace Cottage, uh, in sticking with uh, a lot of the themes that we've seen thus far, uh, surpassed their uh, net patient revenue and operating expense budget for 21 and no surprise the same the same uh, scenario over their actual 2020 experience um, the difference here is that uh, this is an organization that historically has posted uh, operational losses uh, but oftentimes uh, has very strong community support to make up for some of those operating deficits and that situation has not changed uh, but that combined with some of the federal relief money that they've received to offset some of the uh, pandemic uh, costs uh, has really provided some profitability for this organization. And <clears throat> this is an organization that also uh, has experienced some erosion in their commercial or sorry, their uh, Medicare uh, payer mix, but has seen a strengthening on the commercial side uh, with Medicaid remaining uh, relatively flat. Um, but again, uh, this is an organization uh, that is showing here that a couple of utilization statistics uh, have not quite rebounded from 2020. So uh, there could be some pent up demand uh, in that community uh, that eventually um, manifests itself in uh, a revenue surge uh, and also potentially an operating expense surge at the hospital. Uh, or there's also potential that some of those patients perhaps might be going uh, in, in other locations uh, if there are, are problems in, in accessing some care in their community. But uh, we don't have any insight into that. The good news is that physician office visits, those primary care visits at uh, Grace Cottage are maintaining relative balance uh, over the last couple of years. So that is a, a positive out of this is that primary care appears to be uh, relatively strong in that community. It's some of those acute statistics that aren't quite uh, catching up to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, again, 
uh, an organization here that is the beneficiary of federal relief funding with the day's cash on hand. We can see a significant jump there uh, from 19 to 20. Uh, also an organization that uh, has expressed the need to make some renovations around its agent plant. Uh, and so there might be some future plans there as well uh, to make some effort towards that end. But they also cited uh, in their narrative that they continue to make some capital improvements throughout the year uh, to make their facility safer uh, as it relates to pandemic circumstances. Uh, and that is ongoing uh, at that facility as they outlaid in their narrative. <clears throat> Mount Escutney, uh, Mount Escutney uh, really outstripped their uh, budgeted expectations. Uh, this is an organization uh, who produced a significant uh, margin percentage at 9.1% as we discussed, uh, a lot of which has to do with uh, some beneficial uh, activity around the ACO and around federal relief dollars. Uh, you can see that the actual to actual performance is one of the larger variances uh, uh, amongst the hospitals within the system at 25%, uh, far outstripping uh, the growth of operating expenses. But again, context is important. Operating expenses never really subsided uh, for many of these hospitals in 2020. So that variance is going to be much smaller than the revenue rebound that was experienced. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a hospital that did express concern about uh, recognizing about 50%, uh, I believe the figure was, of their relief funds uh, due to a few factors. One was they had a relatively quick recovery on uh, service line activity. Uh, uh, two is um, FPP and ACO transactions uh, that have their uh, auditors concerned about recognizing uh, some of that activity. <clears throat> And the federal COVID relief uh, guidance is also still a concern for them. So they are still holding uh, about 50% of their relief dollars uh, on their books, uh, and they have not recognized them in this space. Uh, but they did acknowledge that uh, some of the changes that were made around the ACO uh, were uh, major drivers of uh, financial activity here at the hospital. Uh, also, though, the uh, again, erosion of payer mix um, over the last couple of cycles uh, being offset in the Medicare and Medicaid space. Um, but you can see when they spoke about quick service line rebound, uh, that holds very true. Uh, this hospital uh, continues to see uh, significant uh, increases over pre-pandemic uh, figures, uh, and there's not the depth of um, uh, utilization statistical change uh, that some of the other hospitals uh, were dealing with. And so that is a positive in this respect. And, and um, also Mount Scotty did cite in their narrative that they took in patients from far outside of their service area. And so they had quite a rebound in that regard in providing care to patients. And they cited their uh, relatively stable staffing situation uh, in their ability to uh, care for extra patients outside of their service area. Uh, so again, uh, the day's cash on hand uh, significantly bolstered uh, by uh, federal relief and profitability, uh, and days of uh, age of plant continues to remain relatively low compared to much of the system. Uh, North Country experienced significant variances in both actual to budget and actual to actual. Um, North Country <clears throat> uh, did have increased volume, uh, largely in largely in their surgical sectors. Um, laboratory uh, was also up. Laboratory revenues, ER, however, was below budget, um, and bad debt and free care was over budget as well. With the return of some of those volumes, so <clears throat> uh, North Country has. Uh, coming out of 17 and 18, really recaptured uh, some positive momentum in that operating margin space that predates the pandemic, uh, but has improved uh, throughout the last couple of years. And so <clears throat> working in that space, they've had some flex fluctuation in uh, commercial payer mix and Medicare payer mix, um, but overall uh, things remain relative to the 2019 comparable um, utilization. But still some some hold back there, uh, but not as severe. And, and additionally, some rebound there in the acute patient space as well. Um, again, another hospital with some significant days cash on hand, 
Uh, however, they did have to make some repairs. The facility is nearly 50 years old and age of plan is getting up there. Uh, so there's likely to be some investment in that space with the day's cash on hand and the rising age of plant as we move forward into uh, the next couple of years. Northeastern, uh, probably one of the closest variants to budget uh, that was experienced in the hospital system at 1%, uh, but operating expenses certainly uh, outstripping budget for uh, a variety of reasons. A lot of the common themes that we expressed are the reasons for that and the logic behind it. Um, again, uh, outstripping their 2020 actual uh, operating margin. This is probably one of the most consistent hospitals from an operating margin perspective, as you can see. Uh, and 2021 uh, being no different, uh, but being slightly elevated at the same time. Uh, so a very uh, steady, sturdy organization from a financial perspective, uh, and that includes uh, navigating the complexities of the pandemic environment. Uh, relatively speaking, payer mix uh, commercial wise has uh, improved for the hospital. Uh, Medicare has seen a bit of a reduction, uh, losing ground primarily to uh, Medicaid concentrations, uh, utilization changes. <clears throat> Uh, you can see here that physician office visits continue to be uh, right up there. Um, one of the items that the organization cited was that they did lose uh, a surgeon from their staff and they have not been able to uh, fill that position as of uh, the time the narrative was written. Their recruiting uh, has been unsuccessful. Um, <clears throat> however, a day's cash in that regard uh, towards some of the challenges they may face, continue to be in uh, respectable territory, uh, and as does uh, age of plant for this hospital. Northwestern Medical Center uh, exceeded their budget in uh, 2021. Uh, a large reason for that was they had a lot of uh, lab testing revenues uh, that drove this. Um, they did exceed uh, 2020 in a significant way, at just over 20%. Um, operating margin, I believe, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I believe they uh, allocated about 70% of that margin is due to federal and state relief funding uh, with a mix of <clears throat> uh, other items that contribute to the rest of it. But uh, a hospital that is undergoing some uh, significant financial changes as we see here. However, uh, they were very cautious in uh, describing their operating margin experience, uh, which uh, reflects uh, the tone that we took at the outset here um, about uh, whether or not uh, having a positive margin in the future with some of the one-off activity that's contributed to that going away as things stand today. Uh, so they recognize that they still have a lot of work to do at the hospital as they uh, navigate their way through uh, the pandemic and the challenges that exist. They did have an uptick in their uh, commercial payer mix this year um, with uh, a, a erosion on uh, the Medicare space. Um, but again, they really cited uh, the COVID impact and the challenges as uh, being the predominant uh, force that they reckoned with this year, uh, and they had to di divert resources to uh, to handle that appropriately. So a lot of mixed activity in the utilization space. They are one of the hospitals that did see uh, an uptick in ER visits uh, where most hospitals did not, uh, and still uh, they have some lagging uh, physician visit activity there as well. Um, but another hospital, again, uh, who has always maintained some very respectable days cash on hand and and the addition of federal funding has made that no different. Uh, and they also continue to have a relatively uh, low age of plant compared to their peers in the state. And, and so, uh, you know, Northwestern has got uh, some new leadership up there uh, and they are uh, handling the challenges as they come. Uh, but COVID certainly uh, provided uh, its fair share uh, in, uh, as far as the operations are concerned of this hospital in 2021. Uh, Porter Medical Center uh, ex exceeded their budget in 2021. Um, operating expenses, however, came in under. A uh, big reason for that was uh, delays to uh, Epic uh, Phase 2 and also 
some staffing shortages that they had and 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 how that uh, reflected on uh, fringe benefits. Uh, we can see here the actual action performance. They uh, significantly outstripped NPR over 20 uh, and also operating expense growth, which is right in line with uh, everything we've discussed so far. Uh, again, another hospital that over the last several years has continued to produce uh, very respectable margins. Um, and that is no different in 2021 with the recognition of uh, federal relief spending on that bottom line. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the best critical access stories from a financial perspective in the state. Uh, and there's no sign that that is going to uh, come to an end anytime soon. Uh, they, they also, being a part of uh, the UVM Health Network, uh, do have some wind at their back in that respect. But as you can see, uh, they didn't join the network until um, sometime in 2017. And so they were already uh, producing um, financially very positive results at that time. And uh, they've made some significant headway in that space uh, coming under the network. Uh, payer mix, uh, they've had uh, kind of a consistent erosion in the commercial space, uh, giving way to uh, uh, Medicare uh, concentrations that are growing. Um, that is really no surprise. Addison County is one of the oldest counties in the state. And so that is a trend that will likely continue uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, utilization changes, they across the board from these stats did have some rebound uh, across each one of these. Although modest for the most part, it is promising to see again, uh, physician office visits having a pretty good uh, recovery from a uh, 28% fall in uh, from 19 to 20. Uh, and again, the same story, days cash on hand, definitely bolstered by activity um, and uh, respectable age of plant bordering on getting a little, uh, little aged in that space. Uh, so there might be some, uh, some renovations occurring in the future to this facility again. And, and uh, additionally, as was discussed at budget time, uh, UVM is assessing uh, all capital projects as it relates to the network based on performance activity at its hospitals. Rutland Regional, uh, a pretty significant variance at 11.5%, uh, including 14% uh, on operating expenses. Uh, as I stated, I, I called them out and I meant that in a good way at the beginning, but their budget was one of the more conservative budgets that we saw. Uh, coming in in 2021, and the truth is that uh, they had significant rebounds in various areas uh, for volume, uh, which drove those revenues up, and also uh, the demands on various supplies and pharmaceuticals to meet uh, that expanding need uh, drove expenses up as well. Um, and you can see when we look at actual performance in 2020 as it relates to that 2021 budget, uh, they did not overreach uh, their potential performance in 2020, which resulted in that uh, conservative budget that they had. And so the variance actual to actual of 15.4% is a very significant uh, rebound for them. So <clears throat> uh, they did recover a, a large chunk of revenues there uh, in that space, and that continues into 2022 uh, in needing to meet unforeseen uh, demand in that community. Uh, operating expenses uh, tell the same tale they have at several other hospitals uh, continuing to rise. And of course, with the fact that uh, expenses did not subside in 2020, uh, an 8.2% growth over that helps compound uh, some of the uh, operating pressures that hospitals are under. Uh, again, uh, another hospital that uh, completely uh, dedicates the majority of their margin to um, federal and state relief funding in 2021. This is a hospital that has gotten by here for several years on some pretty narrow margin activity, instead relying on some of its internal resources to uh, try to keep costs down uh, and maintain uh, what margins that they can. So they do have a bit of a bump here in, in 2021, but again, uh, doubling back to the discussion about how those uh, margins are derived, the reliance on federal relief may not be there in the future. And so some of the cost pressures that are being experienced in 2022 uh, may return them to 
those narrow margins uh, as the year for 2022 presses on. Relatively consistent payer mix at Rutland Regional. Um, they did show some utilization rebound here in almost all categories over their prior year comparable, which does fall into line with some of the volume rebound that they've been experiencing. Um, solid days cash on hand uh, for the most part here, providing a little bit of a cushion uh, to meet some of the challenges. Uh, and then uh, an age of plant that, uh, again, as with some other hospitals, is uh, respectable in its position, um, but bordering on uh, getting a little long in the tooth, so to speak. <clears throat> Southwestern. Uh, Southwestern is another hospital that took a conservative approach to their budget as they were not sure how uh, volumes would rebound, but uh, as it turns out, volumes did rebound, um, and that drove up uh, net patient revenue and uh, the uh, uh, operating expenses that come with such volume rebounds. So we have a 5.5 and 3.8% variance here over budget. And then some significant variances again, uh, which is consistent with the narrative so far um, over 2020 actual and the year that was. Um, again, another hospital that continues to produce some um, respectable operating margins uh, and uh, continues to come in with stories of uh, efficiencies gained and efforts being utilized to uh, maximize uh, the resources at their disposal at uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. So um, their margins continue to be very solid. We can see here that uh, the strength of those margins certainly predates the pandemic. Uh, and then in 2021, uh, incorporating a significant amount of uh, federal and state relief into that operating margin has helped bolster those further. Uh, again, a very stable payer mix in this space as reported to us and some significant rebound in utilization around acute patient days and OR procedures, which uh, is very much in line with the narrative that they've provided. They were one of the hospitals that did see some rebound in emergency room visits. Um, moving to the bottom of the page here, uh, we always note that the day's cash on hand that this hospital reports does not factor in that held by the parent company. So oftentimes it seems low uh, and it is compared to its peers, uh, but those days cash on hand are held largely with the parent company and they are provided with uh, the figures you see here on the screen. This is one of the older hospitals in the state from an age of plant perspective. They are undergoing uh, actively a renovation uh, of their, uh, I believe it's their ED and their hospital entrance. Uh, so we would anticipate as those begin to come online uh, that that age of plant will come down. Uh, so um, not to worry about the today's cash on hand there. Uh, the parent company holds that and there will be um, a financing mix there that occurs to help uh, pay for that project. <clears throat> Springfield Hospital, Springfield's uh, the narrowest of variances uh, for all intents and purposes. They came in at budget uh, on MPR. Uh, a major component of that was some final settlement information that they received with the ACO for 19 and 20, uh, about $4.4 million, and that pushed them up uh, for their NPR FPP to the figures you see on the screen here. Operating expenses continued to be uh, over budget uh, for this hospital, um, but they did, as you can tell, significantly outperform uh, their actual experience. I think that's probably the largest variance that we have in the hospital system. Uh, so Springfield had a, a, some significant operational uh, attributes in the last year. Um, their adult day program was uh, put on hold until July, uh, which is essentially uh, almost their entire fiscal year, three quarters of it, uh, and then their arrangement with the state for their psych facility to hold COVID-only patients there um, really suppressed uh, their revenue generating capacity for about six months. In addition to that, they had lower volumes as well. So they got off to a rough start uh, from a, a revenue perspective, um, but did see a significant rebound as the months went on. And also when the psych facility opened up, they were able to uh, bring in uh, a variety of patients and, and really fill those beds, which was not happening uh, with the arrangement of the state. So uh, once those agreements came to an end, they were able to kind of restart, regenerate, 
and they began to see higher volumes coming in. And ultimately, um, they reported to us, although it's not final final, uh, that they produced a uh, a surplus margin of about six hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars, which is uh, an important uh, rebound compared to some of the other uh, margin activity that this hospital has experienced in recent years. <clears throat> Payer mix, um, slight erosion in the commercial space, uh, also an erosion in the Medicare space uh, with uh, that mix shifting to a more uh, Medicaid dependent uh, payer mix. We don't have a ton of utilization data available, so we don't have that to share. They're still finalizing that, um, but <clears throat> this is a hospital as we move down um, who, again, but to a lesser extent, has benefited from uh, some of the federal relief that has come in. Uh, their days cash on hand are still very low in those low 40s for 2021 and, and upper 40s for 2020. And it's also a hospital that has uh, an increasingly old uh, physical plant. Uh, and without um, cash or investment uh, returns to help pay for that, they will probably continue to age and make repairs as they need to uh, to keep the hospital uh, safe and running. So. <clears throat> Um, Springfield is under new leadership as well, and um, they're looking forward to carrying the organization into the years ahead. And finally, we reached the University of Vermont Medical Center. Uh, this organization missed its budget by 7.6%. Um, there's no secret as to some of the primary reasons why. Uh, pandemic activity being one at the state's largest hospital, the closure of Fannie Allen and the, and the shift of procedures to the main campus where capacity just could not be uh, kept up as it would have been at the Fannie Allen campus, and also the cyber incident that occurred. That had some serious ripple effects uh, that uh, the subsequent months had to absorb, um, and the hospital was never able to quite claw all that back uh, from a revenue perspective. And, and so, um, with that, operating expenses were not significantly over budget, although the hospital does cite uh, workforce shortages being a massive component, both the number and cost of uh, travelers uh, being nearly double. I think the number that they had employed at the end of the year was 342 travelers and with premiums on those staff going up, uh, the cost continues to rise exponentially. Um, which did offset some of the uh, salary and benefits uh, items that they had for their uh, regularly employed staff. Um, again, no huge surprise that they did, even with all of those complications, they still surpassed 2020. Uh, they were one of the hospitals that really felt a pinch from the cessation of those uh, non-emergent elective procedures, uh, largely based on the fact that this organization takes uh, takes care of higher acuity patients, the level of care of patients that they care for. And so when patients don't have anywhere to go, they go there. Also for more complex procedures, um, they will go to the University of Mont Medical Center. So they really, uh, even though they outperformed, their, their 2020 was a, a significant uh, hit to revenues. And as we stated, uh, the operating expenses in 2020 for most of these hospitals did not shift with those revenues. And so um, significant uh, variances occurring here year over year uh, to operating expenses for the University of Mont Medical Center. Now, the, the history of margins here, we can see reductions in margins uh, dating back to 2016 and 2020 being significant. Uh, they did have, uh, as we started this or, uh, discussion, very significant federal and state relief dollars that came in uh, to help relieve some of that. A portion of that they were overlooked for in 2020. Uh, but still, if we're to look at this on a two-year basis here, uh, the organization itself has produced about a $32 million margin in two years. So uh, they've produced in two years what they produced in 2019 alone, and it's about a third of what they produced in 17. So um, there's still some work to do there. Um, the start of this year and the uh, workforce pressures and inflationary pressures that a hospital this size is experiencing are certainly going to play a part in how their 2022 uh, plays out. Um, and so that will probably be true for the entire system as well as the environment continues to shift on a regular basis uh, as it relates to some of those cost pressures. Payer mix remains relatively stable at this hospital. The commercial payer mix is relatively strong. 
Um, but you can see here utilization, they did experience some rebound in some of those places. Physicians office visits uh, still came in under, um, but not as extensive as they were in 2020. Um, this organization has very respectable days cash on hand and age of plant. Uh, they continue to, although they froze most of their capital projects in 2020, they are restarting some of those uh, selectively. Uh, most of them being uh, what they've what they determined to be critical need, um, so that they can weigh the uh, outcome of the layout of cash or financing versus the need for. Uh, uh, some of that physical plan investment to replace or repair those assets. So that brings us to the end of the system analysis and the individual hospital profile. So I'll just do a quick run through here in the appendix of supporting information. Um, a lot of this is just uh, numbers and tables, uh, not something you really want me walking through, um, but some of these point in time uh, metrics that we collect just to show some of the year over year changes in days cash on hand, days receivable, days payable, debt service coverage, and age of plant. NPR and FPP five year results for those at home who want to crunch some numbers here. Um, <clears throat> five year uh, annual growth rate for the system, including the two pandemic years, is 2.9% year over year. Uh, and again, using some of those uh, individual hospital percentages with uh, growth year over year um, based on NPR FPP results. The same thing for operating expenses and operating margins. That is a duplicate slide. So is that one, I apologize. And here is the, um, the individual look at some of these hospitals to provide that illustrative context of how sporadic some of the expectations results are versus that trend. Um, each one of those trends lines 3.5%. Each one of those I bars that we put in is plus or minus 1% off of that. And it's all, they may look different in their uh, size and scale, but it's all dependent on the figures to the left and the vertical axes. Um, and you can see, as discussed, that there is some very significant uh, shifts here going on over time, which again highlights the difficulty in hospitals budgeting and operating this and the Green Mountain Care Board trying to regulate in this environment. Um, <clears throat> and then for those at home who may not understand some of the terminology that we use, we always keep a glossary on hand uh, to help out with that. So, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation here on 2021 and the result activity of the hospital system and the hospitals as a whole. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, I'm going to open it up for board comment or questions. And I'll go in alphabetical order, starting with board member Holmes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Patrick and team, because I know there's a lot of work that goes into putting all these slides together, and it's a tremendous amount of information. Really helpful. Um, and you know, I'm struck by all the variability across the system. And you know, as you highlighted, Patrick, it clearly stems from you know the slingshot effect that you referenced, um, and it makes me it does make me think about how we approach budgets going forward, but I guess that's a conversation for next week. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can just talk about a little bit about the day's cash on hand um, in the sense that, you know, it's a striking, uh, you know, changes over time, but I recognize that it's a, a lot of temporary infusion of federal and state dollars that are driving that. And I'm wondering how we should be thinking about that, how much you'd mentioned, you know, some of these payer advances that are being clawed back and, how do we, how do we think? About, when will we know uh, sort of where the the resting spot of some of this day's cash on hand might be? H how do we interpret this? Certainly. So as we discussed, <clears throat> there is definitely a cushion effect going on here. Um, but the precautionary note about where it might settle is kind of a moving target. Um, because if hospitals continue to experience uh, the surge in costs, or as we hear in various articles, kind of runaway costs uh, and the pressures of workforce and the need for these hospitals to attempt to react to those pressures in uh, shift differentials to maintain folks on, uh, in addition to their normal shift or retention bonuses, uh, overall wage increases, whatever, um, without any further stimulus money coming in, the hospitals kind of get left out in the cold. And so there's this cushion of money that's there to 
help with that. But as that is whittled away, uh, it's going to return to pre-pandemic levels. And so that's really where I get a little bit concerned is that, yes, the balances are healthy as of 930. Um, but what does that mean as we go through uh, fiscal year 22? Because since this activity was finalized, uh, the hospitals have dealt with a very serious um, uh, COVID variant that is Omicron. And we all know about the stories of ICU beds uh, and the concerns that existed throughout much of the winter months. And so uh, a lot of the hospitals when they came in last year with their budgets didn't think matters like inflation or workforce were going to take the turn that they did or the premiums that they're paying on travelers were going to uh, rise like they did. And so there's two things that can happen. They, they can utilize some of these cash balances to cover that, and that can help get them to their next budget cycle where they can then factor that in and try to recapture some of that. Uh, through uh, their budget request in 2023 for all of that unanticipated activity that occurred over the course of this fiscal year. So where that settles is a bit of a moving target. Um, and that's part of the the problematic nature of this uh, <clears throat> this pandemic environment is things seem to be easing as as it relates to the contagion, but there's a lot of consequences that are going to come out of this that hospitals are going to have to grapple with even as the weather gets warmer we move outside and things subside a little bit so um where it settles <laughs> is a very yeah no i just was wondering be. if for example there are um payer advances that are living in there that are going to be you know removed um or you know had to be paid back i just wonder if you know i recognize that everything is volatile and there's a lot of market forces right now i guess i'm just trying to figure out if there's also dollars in there that are going to be um, clawed back in terms of repayments or things like that, too. And do we have a sense of the timing of those? Any I'm to, yeah, I'm trying to recall, and maybe uh, Mike Del Treco, who I think is on the line, may have a little bit more information around that. But there is a deadline by which um, these payer advance, advances will undergo some sort of reclamation, whether they're paid back or uh, the claims that are coming in uh, are offset by these advances. So <clears throat> I'm not sure what the timing on that is. Uh, I know okay. from the last budget cycle that it had begun. And so I'm guessing that over the course of this fiscal year, that should come to a conclusion at some point here soon. Okay, great. No, thank you. Um, I guess if you can go to just slide 15 for a sec. Just another slide that struck me. It's the uh, operating expenses slide. And I guess it's more of a comment than anything else, but just um, a comment. And you walked through it with, with specific examples from each hospital, but there's such a difference in the actual to actual variance, you know, between a hospital such as NMC with their 2.3% you know, increase in operating expenses to a hospital like Copley with a 20% increase in operating expenses. And it is just interesting and trying to figure out and unpack the whys I think will be important as we go forward. Um, what's going to carry forward and what's really a one-time impact. Um, but I, you know, these variations, this variance is is more than we've ever seen. And it, it goes to your point entirely about it's such an odd year. 2020 was an odd year. 2021 is an odd year. And we're going to have to, you know, there's going to be another uh, unique odd year that we're in right now before it all smooths out. And so as 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 regulatory body, we have to be aware of all this variability and all this uncertainty as we go forward. So this just struck me as, you know, an example of the wide range, um, you know, performance across the hospitals and trying to understand why will be really important as we move forward. So I don't really have any other, I, you know, there's a lot to digest here and I really appreciated everything. And I think I need to spend more time digesting, but um, I appreciate all the work here. Thank you, Jess. We'll move to board member lunch. Robin. Hi, I want to echo, echo Jess's thank yous um, because I do think this was a tremendous amount of information and work. Um, I actually don't have any questions like Jess just indicated. I need a little more time to digest uh, the material. I did find it very helpful and I do think um, we're going to continue to have a tough year next year. So I'll leave it at that for today. 
Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll more move to Board Member Pelham. Tom? Uh, and I, I'm going to echo Robin and Jess and say this is a tremendous amount of, of work on 14 moving parts and uh, uh, kind of, I think, going through the pandemic, people might got a sense that everything was the same across the 14, but clearly there are a lot of personalities here in terms of each hospital that, that we're going to have to get to know. Um, I uh, just basically asked her, you know, kind of was a lead into one of my questions. Um, so from a, from a, so we have all the audits for 2021 for all 14 hospitals. All but Springfield. Uh, all but Springfield. Yeah. And um, have you, uh, and it, are the financials that you're presenting today reconciled to those audits or can be reconciled readily? All but Springfield, I believe. Yep. Yeah. All but Springfield. Um, let's see. So, um, do you have any kind of uh, sense now? That, and this kind of gets at the question Jess was asking. Any sense of the kind of magnitude of what might be uh, received out there, but uh, but unrecognized? Uh, so, yes, it, yes, and no. Um, Judging by the narratives, uh, I have not read through the auditor's notes of the audits that the hospital sent, uh, but judging by the narratives, uh, the majority of federal funding that has been received has been recognized by these hospitals with uh, maybe a couple of outliers and even uh, some hospitals who didn't have any additional uh, revenue to recognize in 21. But those who did receive it or who had holdover revenue from 20, uh, with the duration of the pandemic and a growing comfort around uh, some of the federal guidance, have taken all of that in. So when you're looking at uh, the NPR number, and there was one, you don't have to go back to it, but there was one table that kind of broke it out into FFP and and then the the, the other net prep, you know re revenue. Is all of that, to your knowledge, is all of that um, FPP, for example, with Medicaid, I mean, Medicare, has that been reconciled and the books closed on the, on 2021? Or is there still any outstanding issues with, with Medicare, for example, in terms of uh, um, their FPP? That is not a question I can answer. I'm still a little uh, shaky on the timing about how uh, FPP reconciliation occurs as it relates to the hospital fiscal year. So for 2021, my guess would be no, because I believe that occurs on a calendar year. So with the hospital's fiscal year concluding in September, um, that would still leave three months of 2021 activity that would have to occur. So <clears throat> I am not sure how that relates to how these audits are concluded as it relates to some of that FPP, uh, those FPP dollars. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think just in terms of the slingshot, um, whether or not you have any observation about, uh, because Medicaid is basically fixed prospective payments and Medicare is fixed per prospective payments, but it gets reconciled, most of the vol volatility or a lot of the volatility here in the slingshot is in the commercial corner, I would think. That I'm not sure about. Um, the that kind of that slingshot that we're seeing, I don't believe falls along payer lines, uh, pri primarily because uh, some of the reimbursement or payer mix shifts. Yes, there's some space there for the reason for that slingshot and activity, but uh, the patient volume experience that these hospital had was very different on a hospital by hospital experience and very different on the service line experience uh, that I wouldn't want to wager that it falls on payer uh, guidelines or payer boundaries. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure about uh, your question if that's true or not. Yeah, well, we can explore that, but great job, great job. Uh, for you and your team, and uh, I think you set the table pretty well for us to dive in. Thanks. Super.
Thank you, Tom. Now we'll move to board member Walsh. Tom. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patrick and team. Uh, great work. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, check my understanding so far with you and give you an opportunity to say, you know, what I've understood and maybe what I haven't. It, it looks like each facility um, has a pre-pandemic pattern, and then the pandemic hits and every, everyone suffers, utilization drops. Um, that's buffered by the stimulus and relief payments to the extent that 12 of the 14 facilities were able to maintain a positive margin. And looking forward, there's inflationary pressures <clears throat> and there's workforce pressures um, that create some uncertainty. Um, but is it, is it somewhat reasonable to expect that organizations would return to their pre-pandemic performance? They have like a, a signature le leading up to the pandemic. Can we, do you, how much confidence do you have that they may return to their pre-pandemic um, performance? Really hard to say. Um, it's hard to say because we don't have any insight into some of the hard lessons that are being learned as a result of this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's probably some very different thinking going on in these organizations about what their organization is going to look like uh, as we potentially enter the backside of these very uh, difficult years. And so it's it's hard to say in that respect. Um, we're going to be seeing some leadership turnover at some of these organizations. Uh, most notably comes to mind is at uh, Brattleboro and UVM. And so that's going to provide opportunities for hospitals to change their trajectory a little bit. Yeah. So <clears throat> that with some of the lessons that have come about from this, uh, hopefully begin to uh, chart a new course. Mm. Um, but as for what uh, that experience that was in the world previous to the pandemic, it's really hard to say. Uh, I, I sincerely hope that uh, some of those patterns that were exhibited there don't return. Uh, yeah. with these hospitals. So um, I've got to take a pass on that. I think there's a lot within that statement that's kind of outside of our understanding right now. Fair enough. And would it, um, I wonder if it'd be helpful to look at um, more years going back to understand the year over year variability for a bigger piece of time pre-pandemic to um, to understand if there's any stability in that, in the noise of that system for each facility, um, understanding that there's there was a shock, there was a cushion, there's uncertainty about the future, um, but to better understand the the longer term prior performance might might be helpful at least in my mind, and I'm wondering what you think of that. Well, that's something that we certainly have the uh, capacity to produce. We've been keeping records going back uh, almost two decades, I think, within our, our files that we can uh, build off of. But if we're to look at maybe the five to 10 years leading up to the pandemic and assess uh, some, some of the fluctuations that occurred on a year-to-year -year basis versus what we're experiencing now, that is certainly something that we can dig into, especially if it's helpful to you to get your uh, bearings in as you come into an environment that's anything but stable uh, at this time. It has a great amount of variability to it. Right. Well, I'll, I will, um, I'll, I'll try to learn from you all. I don't want to create extra work for anybody, but understanding the performance of the hospitals um, with, with their margin and cash on hand, age of facility, um, I really like the images that you, the figures that you produced for that. Understanding that um, history um, more than just back to, to uh, 2017 or 2018, but going back a little bit further um, to, to see what that variability was like leading into it, leading into the pandemic. We see the shock, there's a cushion, we have uncertainty, but 
what does the past suggest about what the future might look like? Um, I'm, I'm interested in that, or at least discussing it with everyone um, next week. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, I want the record to reflect that at three o'clock, board member lunch uh, must leave. We are in the middle of a legislative session and um, she is graciously working on the board's behalf on uh, writing some language for a bill that is moving very quickly as crossover approaches in the legislature. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, um, besides a big thank you to Patrick and his team, I wanna publicly acknowledge and thank, as I have previously, but want to continue to do, um, the outstanding work that's been done by our congressional delegation, bringing dollars to Vermont hospitals in order to keep them whole throughout the pandemic. And if it had not been for the hard work of our congressional delegation, bringing those dollars to our healthcare institutions, um, this picture would look much, much worse. So thank you to our congressional delegation and um, like others, uh, there's huge variation um, and uh, we are going to have our work cut out for us this summer as we go through the budgets for each of these hospitals individually. And I do think that um, we, the board did make a wise decision last year not to have any enforcement for this year because it would be hard to justify enforcement action given the, the extreme period of uncertainty that these hospitals have been through for over two years. So with that, I am going to open it up for public comment. And at this time, does any member of the public wish to offer comment on um, the presentation today? And I'll start out with Mike Del Treco. Mike, are you there? I am. Can everybody hear me and see me? We can now, yes. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, first, uh, I just want to take a minute to express my thanks to Patrick and the budget team for their efforts, um, specifically outlining some of the uh, challenges and you know real vulnerabilities related to fiscal year 21, 22, and into, into the future. Um, I want to emphasize a few points that have been discussed but I think are really important um, to to really emphasize. I am um, concerned that those that aren't familiar with federal funding might jump to the conclusion that is all well with the hospital delivery system. And you know, in the in this inner circle, I'll call it. We know that's not necessarily true. But so I want to take a moment to go through a few things. Um, one, as mentioned, operating margins with the recognition of a, about this year, $129 million of PF, PRF funds, where $87 million are positive 2.8%. If those funds were not used, we'd have a negative $41 million margin, or negative 1.3%, a swing of four percentage points, not insignificant. With PRF funds, two hospitals still had negative margins. And without those PR funds, seven hospitals would have been uh, in that negative position, uh, more characteristic of uh, the past. Um, so uh, maybe a minor suggestion is that slides 16 through 18 should include a with and without PRF funding, um, just to really illustrate that point. As an industry, we are very challenged with is fast approaching. Um, and makes pre-pandemic performance probably a thing of the past. As we look to the future, we have a very cha challenging labor market that already includes increases for current workforce, traveler, new traveler type expenses, and the combined with the need that, w that we have coming down the pike around future de demand. This includes aging workforce, new salary requirements, and the real issue that we often forget is the mental health challenges that our current workforce will face exiting this pandemic, a, a big concern to mine, of mine. Uh, two, concerns related to decreasing utilization and revenues related to 
COVID activity. Um, yes, the pandemic is terrible, but it has had a positive increase on hospital um, revenues. So that will be declining. Um, we have inflationary growth in the energy sector like we've never seen before. This issue alone will have significant impact on everything a hospital buys or does moving into the future. And then finally, as we've all talked about, the elimination of PRF funds into the future will put um, us in a new uh, situation as we as we move forward. And I did want to talk briefly about the uh, cash positions of organizations, and I and I'd use two words: uncertainty and volatility. And I want to emphasize that the change in the cash position does not mean Vermont hospitals have too much cash. These dollars are critically important for, for Vermont's hospital pandemic recovery, revitalization of infrastructure, and repayment of other things like Medicare advance loans, or um, I hope it doesn't happen in Vermont, but audits that uh, force hospitals to potentially repay uh, PRF dollars. Equally important, is to, we need to recognize that just alone in the first quarter of calendar year 2022, the stock market has lost almost 20%. So these cash numbers from 2021 have changed already. So again, uh, thanks uh, to the budget team for all their work. Uh, Patrick, uh, really, really appreciate working with you. And, and Lori, whenever your date is that you're moving on, I will certainly miss you as well. Nobody will miss her more than this board. <laughs> Thank you for uh, those uh, words, Mike, and uh, very well said and points well taken. Uh, next, you. I'm going to call on Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, just a couple of timing questions. I'm curious uh, what the what the time framework is be as you move to, before you get to a full final uh, piece of guidance for all the hospitals. Can you say roughly when that will be? So I can't give you any certainty on an end date, but I can tell you that each of the rest of the meetings for the month of March are uh, inclusive of hospital budget guidance discussions, and those will start next Wednesday. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So in other words, I'm just inferring from that that it pretty much is very likely that you'll have a final position on guidance by May 1, roughly. Maybe that's unfair. Well, I think by May one, certainly, I would hope quicker than that. Okay, that's that's fine. That's that that is that is my question. My second question is, um, it looks like there are going to be some uh, mid-year correction uh, requests by hospitals. At least, probably, I think you, you somebody said that Rutland was going to have one, and I believe UVM is going to have one. Is there a time frame for that? In other words, is there any? Uh, I don't know. Patrick might know this. Is there any point? at which you either, if you're a hospital, you either have to ask for a mid-year correction on, on your, your rates or you, you can't do it in that fiscal year. There is, and I don't know if Patrick or Mike Barber has the stat, the language, the rule language in front of them. I believe it's by May 1st, but I would defer to Mike to uh, support that statement. And just to confirm, Ham, the only hospital that has, that has officially asked for a rate hike mid-year so far has been Rutland. We have heard from two others that may be coming in. Uh, I would say one is definitely coming in. Um, and that Rutland hearing is scheduled for 8 a.m. on March 17th. Great. That, that, uh, thanks for that, Kevin. I think that there's been a a story in the press that has been around the whole United Healthcare thing uh, that UVM is coming into. That, I don't know that, but I mean I, that was in, that's been in the news. But in any event, I I I, I, I think if if I'm just going to assume it's roughly May one, and that if that's not exactly right, uh, you can get it to me later. It would be um, improper for us to mention. Um, somebody who might be coming in. Well, I know that's that, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm just but, but the uh, but what we can look forward to is that you'll that sit, let's say by May 1 that you're that the uh, that the pattern for the uh, FY23 will be basically set. You'll have the guidance done. If you have it done earlier, that's great. 
uh, you'll have the guidance done and you will have seen, you will have seen whatever um, uh, uh, change request that you're going to get. Hopefully, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? If not, I wish to uh, thank Patrick and the team for an excellent presentation, a lot of data and uh, a lot to uh, chew over. So um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? I'm hearing someone speak, but I'm not hearing them very loudly. Maybe that was just background noise. Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been, it's been moved and moved a couple times and seconded a couple times to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.